Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 2004 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, The Science of Fat, will be given by Dr. Ronald Evans, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, and Dr. Jeffrey Friedman, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the Rockefeller University. The third lecture is titled, Balancing the Fat Equation. And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Check. Good morning and welcome back to our exploration of the science of fat. Yesterday we heard from Jeffrey Friedman about events that occur above the neck in the brain with respect to our uh, appetite and eating behavior. In this next lecture, Ron Evans will take us below the neck to the important physiology that occurs throughout the body so that we can start to understand the complex ways that the body uses fat. Ron has found two molecules that control how the body balances the storing and the burning of fat. These are called nuclear receptors. The nuclear refers to the fact that they uh, do their job in the cell nucleus. One of these nuclear receptors, PPAR gamma, is important for fat storage, and drugs that activate gamma are currently important in the treatment of diabetes. Now, gamma's cousin, which is another nuclear receptor called PPAR delta, revs up the burning of fat and Ron will tell you about the potential to develop anti-obesity drugs based on activating delta. Ron's talk is entitled Balancing the Fat Equation. And now let's have a brief video to introduce our speaker. that science is a little bit of being a professional student. It's learning how to ask questions uh, and seek answers about the world. The reality is that science is completely open. You can get into it at any time. It takes a little bit of imagination and some skill, but it appeals to a broad range of people. So if you're highly technical, it's great. If you're mathematical, there's a whole component for you. If you're oriented towards biology, it is completely open at every level for boys, girls, uh, lots of different ways to approach uh, the problems of biomedical research. And there is something for everyone, and it brings out your own personality and the way that you approach life. I would say that science today is at one of its most powerful moments in history. This century is going to be about biomedical discovery. What are the big questions for biologists today? For me, understanding life. How does a single cell know how to become a three trillion cell organism? And we're seeing the unity in life emerging before our eyes. It's an enormously exciting era that we are in. We began the free fall of science a number of years ago, and we're now in it. And it's going to go on for a long time. There's a tremendous amount to do to understand disease, its cure, tremendous opportunities coming with stem cells and regenerative medicine, tremendous opportunities in understanding the brain, neurologic processes and disease, it's open. And so for me, uh, as much as I've been in it, uh, it's only become ever more exciting. And so I think that 
I, I see the future as even more promising uh, than where we've been. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we had a great uh, first, uh, second first and second lecture yesterday, and it was a very exciting day. And uh, I'm really uh, happy to see all of your smiling faces here again, and look forward to another uh, great lecture. Uh, and thanks to Tom for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, yesterday, I left you uh, fat and diabetic, um, and I'm going to try to help uh, get ourselves out of that. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about relate to how uh, classes of hormones work in the body. And if any of you saw USA Today in the last few days or some of the newspapers, you've seen a lot about how steroids are, are being abused by athletes. Um, this is in the news uh, all the time. Um, these hormones are the same class of hormones that I'm going to be talking about. And so as you uh, listen to this lecture, you can translate a little bit about what I'm going to say into actual news events. Uh, that you're seeing uh, in the media today. Um, I thought I'd take a couple minutes briefly just to look at some of the models that are up here uh, because we didn't mention these yesterday. I did talk about the coronary artery, which is this cut out here, uh, and the heart, uh, and the role in fat uh, in metabolic syndrome uh, and in heart disease. This is five pounds of muscle right here. Ugh. Five pounds of muscle. Um, and this is five pounds of fat. So you can see that, relatively speaking, muscle by weight uh, is much more compact uh, than adipose tissue. Uh, here's one pound of fat. And these are other models of one pound uh, of adipose tissue uh, back there. When you eat a high-fat diet, the fat goes into your blood. Uh, and when you shake this thing, this is sort of the, the image of what uh, the fat is circulating around before it gets stored in all your adipose tissue. Um, so if you get a chance, take a look at some of these uh, models, and you can handle them. They're, they're quite interesting. So I told you about how increasing weight uh, tends to uh, 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 bring us towards a problem called Syndrome X. We're going to talk about that, not just from the weight problem, but actually what's happening uh, at the molecular level today. We did talk about the role of environment, uh, changes in social attitudes uh, that might contribute to some of the weight changes. Uh, the increase in exposure to a high caloric, high fat diet, such as fast food diets and fried foods, uh, which are prevalent. Um, PlayStation Nation, the reduction of exercise that can actually play into uh, the weight problem. Uh, and we even mentioned uh, the role of marketing. And as I, I said, that uh, Marshall McLuhan, um, McLuhan um, said that, uh, that the 20th century uh, that the art form of the 20th century was really advertising, uh, and we're very susceptible uh, to that. So uh, moving into the, the body of the talk, uh, one key feature of trying to understand uh, metabolic syndrome is drilling into the, mole the molecular details of what is actually going on. By understanding a disease, uh, we can bring a scientific approach to really addressing to how to treat that disease. So this will uh, inform us about designing drugs, thinking about pharmacology, physiology. Uh, fat itself can be informational. Uh, it's not just calories. It can instruct the body as to what to do. It can act like a hormone. And that's what I want to talk about uh, in the first part of the lecture. Um, if we think about how hormones work, and I'm going to tell you the two fundamental ways uh, in which hormones work. Um, hormones. Uh, uh, can either act at the cell surface or at the membrane uh, of the cell, or they can act uh, within the cell itself. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, how hormones act at the cell surface. This is a schematic uh, of a receptor uh, for the molecule insulin. And this will be our model for a uh, hormone, in this case secreted by the pancreas, acting at the surface of the cell. It binds to its receptor, the insulin receptor, where it triggers uh, an event uh, within the cytoplasm of the cell, which is shown here, as these cubes uh, and these spheres uh, and these tubes. Um, as the translation of the activation event from the outside, leading to a series of scripted events on the inside. Uh, and this is one key pathway, and this can uh, affect other components uh, in the cytoplasm, the membrane, 
as well as the nucleus. Now, in addition, um, there is uh, another class of receptors, which are shown here, that reside in the nucleus. Um, and the hormones for these receptors are uh, fats or fat-derived molecules or lipid-like molecules or drugs. And uh, shown in green uh, are the lipid-like hormones uh, that are coming through the uh, bilayer. They do not need a cell surface receptor. They can enter into the cytoplasm where they can uh, diffuse and ultimately enter the nucleus, uh, find their receptor. And as you'll see uh, in this expansion here, uh, the ligand makes contact with the receptor, uh, and that triggers uh, a change uh, uh, in its uh, activity. And I'll show you a diagram of this uh, where the receptor is able to activate target genes. And we'll describe that uh, in more detail in a moment. Uh, but before I do, I simply want to emphasize there are many different kinds of nuclear hormone receptors, and these control diverse aspects of body physiology. Um, some of the ones uh, that you might be familiar uh, relate to hormones secreted by the adrenal gland, uh, such as cortisone or cortisol, um, and that has its own receptor that is in many tissues in the body. It activates sugar metabolism, and it's also a potent anti-inflammatory drug on its own. Um, hormones from the thyroid gland control your basal metabolic rate. That is how uh, your metabolism is when you are sleeping how warm you are. We're all burning energy at all times, uh, and this is sort of our body's thermostat for that. Again, it's controlled by activity uh, in the nucleus. Uh, the gonads, uh, uh, te the testes and ovaries, uh, produce testosterone and estrogen. Much of these are in the news, uh, either for contraception, hormone replacement, or in the case of uh, androgens, anabolic steroids. Uh, athletes uh, uh, tend to abuse these hormones uh, because they're relatively easy to take and get a hold of. We now have ways to trace this, but nonetheless, they're widely used because they give certain advantages uh, to athletic performance. Uh, just as powerful are receptors for dietary fats. Instead of being secreted by an organ, uh, these fats are ingested uh, through the foods that we eat. Some of the fats in these foods uh, are informational, as I had mentioned, uh, and some of these can actually interact uh, with nuclear hormone receptors to stimulate their activity. Um, there may be other types of molecules that can interact with the same receptors, uh, and these molecules produced within the body uh, are also of interest. Uh, and so I'm going to drill in a little bit more on uh, the receptors for fatty acids, since this links dietary fat to body fat um, and provides an interesting uh, way to uh, try to understand the nature of uh, fat formation uh, and metabolism. So there are three uh, receptors for fatty acids. They're all very similar to each other. They're called PPARs. Um, and the uh, three related receptors are called alpha, gamma, uh, and delta. And I'll talk a little bit about these receptors. Uh, one feature of the receptors is that they are expressed in different levels in different tissues. And so PPAR gamma is expressed at particularly high levels uh, in adipose tissue and a few other tissues in the body. Uh, PPR alpha is expressed at high levels in the liver, and PPR delta is widely expressed, but particularly high uh, in skeletal muscle. Now, if we look uh, more at PPR gamma, because that's what I'm going to focus on initially. Uh, you're going to see that this receptor plays an unusually important role, uh, and it's uh, a very special receptor uh, relative to many other types of genes uh, in the body. Um, it is a fat sensor, as I had mentioned, to dietary fats and other types of related molecules. Importantly, this receptor is one of the few master regulators uh, in the body. There are a few genes that have been designated as master determinants of either muscle or fat or certain organs. Um, and uh, PPAR gamma is a master determinant uh, for the formation of adipose tissue. Without this receptor, you're unable to form uh, fat tissue itself. It's also required for the maintenance and function of adipose tissue, uh, and therefore, by changing its activity, you can change the signals that emanate uh, from fat. Uh, and through these changes, I'll describe to you how this can affect uh, the process of insulin resistance. 
And so we have a fat receptor that ultimately is going to affect sugar metabolism. So let's begin to look in more detail. PPA or gamma, uh, as shown on this balance, uh, is involved in promoting the storage of fat in adipose tissue. Uh, its other two cousins, PPA or delta and PPA or alpha, are involved in consuming or the burning of energy. So nature has used a family of very related uh, receptors uh, to control two opposing processes in the body, storage and burning uh, of fat. And so if we want to look at this, I'm going to uh, actually uh, take you through a little journey um, uh, uh, of what's going on in adipose tissue and take you from the fat tissue itself uh, to the fat cell uh, and to the gene. Uh, and so if we can roll the video, um, what I'm going to show you is the uh, uh, adipose tissue, which was next to some, a muscle tissue, and we zoom in on it, and we see that the adipose tissue is con uh, composed of millions of individual cells. And I'm going to focus on uh, one cell as a model, uh, but remember this event is going on in all cells. And a sample of fat uh, tissue uh, has been included in your packet, which we looked at yesterday. Here is the fat cell, which contains a nucleus. It contains uh, a cytoplasm. And a specialized structure in this fat cell is the lipid droplet, or the fat droplet, that, sto that stores triglycerides uh, as the energy source and can release them based on communication with the rest of the body. Uh, the fat cell is a hormone secreting cell. Uh, uh, Dr. Friedman spoke about leptin yesterday. It also secretes hormones such as adiponectin in red and resistin uh, in blue. Uh, and changes uh, in the size uh, of the fat cell and the amount uh, of uh, lipid that it contains can change the balance of these informational hormones and shift things such as insulin sensitivity uh, and appetite. Uh, and so the nature of the fat cell uh, and how large it is is very important to us. Now, in 1995, we discovered that PPR gamma can respond to a certain class of drugs, which are shown here in blue. Uh, and these drugs, when given to the cell, diffuse across the membrane and cytoplasm and are able to interact with PPR gamma receptor in the nucleus, as is shown here on genes. Here's the drugs coming in which when it binds will trigger a conformational change in the receptor shown there, which causes uh, the dissociation of a repressor mechanism for genes and allows activators to come in. This stimulates the activity of this gene. And because PPR gamma is in several locations in the nucleus, a network of genes becomes activated that changes the, the balance of proteins that are produced by the cell changes the function of the cell by activating this network. As the fat cell grows, the balance of these hormones uh, can shift. And here it's growing because more lipid is contained. This shifts the balance. However, if we give the drug P for PPAR gamma, you can increase the production of adiponectin. So giving the drug causes this increase, and this promotes insulin sensitivity, uh, which is an important feature because Big fat cells often lead to insulin resistance. By doing that, this adipose or fat pad can be large, and yet the patient uh, or the individual that has this can be insulin sensitive. And without the drug, they would be insulin resistant. And so we can use this genetic manipulation to shift the information that's emanating uh, from the adipose tissue uh, to benefit uh, an individual. But remember, it does not take the fat away. It leaves, you, uh, leaves the adipose tissue there. So you're not getting any thinner, uh, but you're having a healthier uh, uh, fat pad. OK, now I want to look at the relationship now between this growing fat pad uh, that's proximal to the muscle tissue uh, and how this impinges uh, on glucose. So remember, we spoke yesterday about the insulin highway and how elevated levels of glucose uh, from our liver or from our diet stimulate the pancreas to produce insulin, which then allows sugar to be delivered into target tissues such as muscle. And fat has something to say about this. Uh, and the more fat we have, uh, the more communication there's going to be about sugar. Uh, and as you see here, uh, fat, increasing fat can cause a uh, glucose gridlock. It can inhibit uh, glucose entering uh, to the muscle because this muscle becomes insulin resistant. 
Um, and how does this happen? Well, I mentioned already that fat is a hormonal tissue. It not only stores uh, uh, energy, but it also ha is, releases information in the form of secreted hormones. Uh, and in the uh, normal individual, uh, you can see the ratio of different types of hormones that are being secreted. And as these fat cells grow and as the adipose tissue grows, the balance of uh, these hormones uh, is shifting. And that balance uh, tends to instruct the body to behave uh, in a different way. So let's look at a few of these instructions. Um, here, we place the tissue in the body uh, because it is living. Uh, and if we look at a normal individual, this just shows secretion of hormones that can instruct the muscle to be insulin sensitive, uh, that can instruct the brain about appetite, that can act on the liver to also influence uh, liver uh, metabolic function. Uh, however, uh, in someone who is obese, there is a different set uh, of instructions uh, that are coming uh, from this adipose tissue, change in the balance, as you can see here, to each of these tissues, and that starts to reprogram the body. So the amount of fat stored begins to lead to a change in the balance or a shift. Uh, and we want to know how we can use drugs to affect that. I think I already mentioned, I'll ask anyone, what is the master regulator that we might be able to shift the balance with? Anyone? Someone back there. PPAR gamma. Excellent job. You know, I have something for you, but I don't know if I can get it all the way back there. This is a little bit too, too far, and it could be dangerous. I have such a powerful throat here. But I will leave it up there, and we'll get it to you later. Look what I'm giving you, a, a, a C's lollipop, um, which is appropriate for a lecture like this. Yes, uh, that's exactly right, uh, PPAR gamma. Uh, so at least you were paying attention there. Um, and by giving PPR gamma to someone uh, who is overweight or obese, uh, we can uh, cause insulin sensitization uh, of adipose tissue and a reprogramming uh, of the hormones from this larger fat pad to make it seem like it's a thin fat pad. But it's not a cure, obviously, because uh, the individual still has the increased adiposity. And if we look at it in terms of the insulin highway, where we have the glucose gridlock due to the excess adipose tissue, um, if we uh, give PPR gamma, this lets the adipose tissue store the fat in a safer way so it's less toxic in that sense uh, to our body physiology. Uh, and in this way, uh, activation of the PPAR gamma network uh, is going to be highly uh, insulin sensitizing. And uh, to uh, look through this uh, in a little bit more detail, um, just as a, really as a summary, what I've done here is sort of taking you through uh, the uh, exercise of understanding the relation between these three classes of receptors. I really did not talk very much about PPAR alpha. Um, alpha promotes uh, energy burning in the liver. Uh, and in fact, there are drugs to PPAR alpha which are commonly prescribed to lower blood lipids uh, because it promotes fat burning. Uh, in the next segment, I'm going to talk about PPR delta and some new exciting areas in which PPR delta active drugs can also promote new aspects uh, of fat burning uh, uh, to oppose the action of PPAR gamma. This does not mean PPAR gamma uh, is not important. We need adipose tissue. Uh, it just shows uh, the importance of getting that balance uh, 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 together. And so I'm going to stop uh, at this level, uh, and I'm going to take a few questions before we go on to the next segment. <laughs> all right, let's start, let's start right here. Is there any advantage towards having all the fat in one area in the large pads, or just having it evenly distributed through the body? So the question was, is there any advantage to have uh, the fat stored in one area, uh, such as fat pads? Um, the, as you can see here um, uh, in these diagrams, and we mentioned a little bit yesterday, that fat is widely distributed. So there's always going to be fat embedded in muscle because muscle is one of the primary uh, tissues that demands uh, fat. Then there are many storage sites that we need and nature ha has programmed so that if we hit times of famine, oftentimes in the winter when food is less available, where stored peripheral fat 
uh, is a very valuable source to stay alive. And it's very characteristic of individual species where their long-term storage fat pads are. It's different in rodents and squirrels. Uh, and mice, for example, have a special fat pad uh, on their, uh, their back uh, that they use to generate heat called brown adipose tissue. Um, and when it gets cold, this tissue just burns fat and generates heat. It's not used so much for muscle energy, but to produce heat. We only have a little bit of, of brown adipose tissue uh, for heat generation. And so each of the fat pads uh, either provide immediate energy to muscle or longer-term storage when uh, you uh, starve. And I should say that people are very good at starvation. It's something that, that is part uh, of our genetic makeup. So we're very good at feasting, and we're very good at fasting. Um, and during the feast, we will store all the energy that we can. Uh, and during the fast, we will slowly burn these energy stores down from the fat pads. So that's a good question. I'll give you a shirt for that. This one I can get. Right here. You said that uh, the gamma um, regulates insulin resistance. Um, is there any way to like change that so that you can help people with diabetes? Yes. Well, so there are drugs now to PPA or gamma. I should be pretty specific about that. And thank you for the question. Um, um, there are two prescription drugs. There are about a five billion dollar a year set of drugs now that. Uh, uh, function uh, to activate PPA or gamma. These are widely used in type 2 diabetics. They act to promote insulin sensitivity. So as we gain weight, um, the ability of PPA or gamma to promote insulin sensitivity goes down, and the drugs seem to ramp up the system. Um, and so these drugs are very popular. The problem is that when you give the drug over a long period of time, people tend to gain weight. Uh, because it stimulates the adipose tissue to hold on to more fat. Um, and so it does that in a safe way, but on the other hand, uh, the one thing that patients don't like is that they're putting on a bit more weight. Uh, and so it, there's always a yin-yang uh, for these types of drugs uh, in activating their genetic programs. Uh, you kind of get what you ask for, so the patient's healthier, but they're certainly not any thinner. Good question. Okay, right here in yellow. The drug that you give the, with the PPAR gamma in it, can you develop a tolerance towards it, or do you just need the same dosage the whole time? For PPR gamma? Um, actually, there's been very little evidence for development of resistance to the drug itself. Um, it's fairly well tolerated. There are a few side effects, which I mentioned. One is weight gain. The other is water retention, uh, which is not also a welcome side effect uh, for people. Um, and uh, that causes some compliance problems. But mostly the drug is well tolerated. Uh, and so, um, you know, there, there are um, uh, some advantages and disadvantages to these types of drugs, and new ones are coming along the pipeline, uh, but no resistance has been seen so far. Uh, and I should say that the receptor which I showed you that we characterized back in 1995 as the actual target for the drug is now uh, under study in probably a dozen different pharmaceutical companies across the world using that receptor now as the molecular target for drug discovery uh, and using assays that we developed uh, in our lab uh, to um, uh, refine these drugs to a new level. And it really shows how basic research can impact on that drug discovery process. I'll give you this and maybe we'll have. Some, something from the back. Let's go way to the back, yo, in red, yeah. Yesterday you mentioned that unsaturated fats can communicate with other tissues and saturated fats cannot communicate. And I was wondering if that meant that the saturated fats don't contain the PPAR trio of hormones? Yes, and so she was asking, uh, I said some fat's informational, all fat is caloric. Um, and the saturated fats have the least amount of information, and that is true. The saturated fats are the fats that are least able to bind to PPAR gamma, uh, alpha, or delta. And because of that, they kind of go by those receptors. Uh, they don't have the information. Uh, they don't activate uh, uh, as much of the fat burning pathways. Um, and they're simply stored as part of the let's grab all the energy mechanism uh, in the body. And so, 
they're easier to store and they don't trigger as much fat burning. So that's a very good question. So there are some fats which are informational and the saturated fats have the least amount of information but all the calories. I think that, that uh, we're going to have to move on. I'll take some more questions uh, in the next segment. Okay. Um, so um, we're here I'm going back to uh, our surfer uh, and then our channel surfer. Um, <laughs> this is how we started, uh, and this is where we ended up uh, in uh, the uh, in lecture two. Um, with the pattern shifting from the trunks to the chair. Um, we saw the progress, the sort of the complex journey uh, that um, we went under to go from uh, young and in fit shape to out of shape. Um, but now if we're in this condition, and there's a growing number of people in the Western world, the United States, uh, that are in this condition. As Jeff mentioned yesterday, and I've been trying to emphasize, Metabolic syndrome, or syndrome X, is the most rapidly growing medical problem uh, in the country. Uh, and so now, how can we deal with the problem? How can we use science to really understand what this problem is? And what is actually the magnitude of the problem? How big is the weight problem, literally? And so I've done a calculation, and this is a very conservative calculation in the United States at how big the problem is. The problem is three billion uh, five million pounds, which is shown here. That is, this is how much the United States, as a society, as a collective group, is overweight. We are billions and billions of pounds overweight. Uh, and if you look, uh, this is not uh, actually changing. It's going up uh, as we speak. Um, and in fact, this is a very conservative estimate, and I could be clicking uh, the clicker for the whole lecture as we watch the weight uh, of the United States. Uh, go up. We are expanding uh, at a relatively rapid rate, at an alarming rate, um, and this is causing the major medical problems that are driving the health care budget uh, to such high levels. Uh, it's hard to tell a country that the best way to lose this weight, and we need to lose three billion pounds as a society, is to exercise and to diet. Uh, we know that is not effective because we've been telling people that and the weight problem really has not changed. The trend is still continuing to increasing weight. Um, and so we need to think about how we can use science to address this problem. Uh, if we look at the uh, balance, the energy balance here, um, there are various ways to think about how this can happen. Uh, one is, as Tom mentioned, above the neck, uh, where we can look at appetite control uh, and see. We know it's hard to tell people to change your appetite. But uh, as Dr. Friedman is doing and others and pharmaceutical companies, maybe we can use our understanding of the uh, appetite pathways to address uh, uh, how we can develop drugs or pharmaceuticals to control appetite. Uh, the other is the below the neck approach, which is to expend more energy. Now again, we can tell people to exercise, but exercise uh, is not something that people uh, do at their maximal level of efficiency to burn off enough calories to change this trend. And so again, uh, is there a way for pharmaceutical uh, intervention uh, that can cause us to expend more calories? And in fact, there have been a number of drugs over the years that increase metabolism and will cause increased uh, expenditure of calories in the form of heat. But some of the side effects of these drugs uh, have not been very safe, and so uh, they have very limited use because of safety issues. So, how can we use the receptors that we've been talking about to address this issue? Uh, let's look back at PPAR. Uh, the PPARs, uh, in particular, I want to focus on uh, one of these receptors now, PPAR delta. Uh, the PPAR delta receptor, uh, which I'm showing here uh, uh, associated with muscle, um, is particularly interesting because this is associated with oxidative metabolism. That is, this receptor, instead of promoting fat storage, promotes fat burning uh, by increasing uh, the ability of muscle cells and other cells to take in long-chain fatty acids and break them down and convert them into ATP for energy. Now, can we use this receptor as uh, a genetic regulator to help manipulate this pathway? And so one of the questions is, uh, can we 
with these uh, with delta man, sort of like Superman here. Um, can we use uh, the PPR delta receptor uh, and uh, a drug or its ligand to rev up uh, metabolism? And in addressing this question, in fact, I'm going to show you some animals that we have generated to, uh, that address this question. Uh, it's relevant to know uh, what the substrate is that we're working on. And the substrate of muscle is actually quite interesting. It's, it's both complex and simple at the same time. We all have an image of muscle. There's an, a diagram of it up here. Uh, muscle is composed of two key fiber types that are in bundles. Um, one fiber type is called fast twitch, which is shown here. Uh, and the other is a slow twitch muscle, which is shown here. Fast twitch is often called glycolytic uh, fiber. It burns sugar for energy. It's fast twitch because it's involved in speed. Uh, Mo Green, for example, the sprinter, is the only human who can do the 100 meter dash in 9.79 seconds without steroids. Uh, we know others can do it with steroids. Uh, certainly, it tells you what the body can do. Um, this is fast switch. It expends a lot of energy. In those 10 seconds, basically, that individual is exhausted. Uh, the other is non-fatiguing muscle uh, that is typical uh, of long-distance sports, marathon runners, cyclists such as Lance Armstrong, for example. Um, and uh, this muscle goes on and on and on, but it's in the more repetitive, uh, slower motion. These muscle fibers are innervated by different motor neurons uh, from our spinal cord, uh, and these motor neurons direct the fiber type, fast or slow twitch. Uh, you've seen muscle fiber uh, in various types of guises. Of course, we all just got through uh, Thanksgiving, um, and you're often asked, do you want white meat or dark meat? Light meat is the fast twitch muscle, um, and the dark meat, which is the richer meat, it's more textured, uh, has increased myoglobin content. Uh, it's able to capture more oxygen, increased fat, so it's a richer meat uh, uh, than uh, the, the white meat. Um, and so uh, that, the genetic programs that make it light or dark uh, relate to its energy utilization. Um, <clears throat> so here's the, uh, the Arnold is born fast twitch, and Lance is going to be uh, more slow twitch using the turkey analogy. And certain types of animals, and you've seen this, if migratory birds, for example, that, that fly long distances will have much more dark meat, like duck, for example, or geese. And they'll also be a much richer type of uh, food to eat. Um, so what are the differences between these muscle fiber types? Um, these muscle fiber types uh, are, contain uh, structures called mitochondria. I'm sure that all of you have uh, studied this. Uh, they're, in the fast twitch, this is a histologic section uh, of fast and slow twitch, and you can see differences just by uh, histologic stains. This is a stain for ATPase, and it shows that the non-fatiguing muscle has much more ATPase in it because it's going to be uh, uh, burning ATP uh, at much higher levels for a much longer time. Um, and this is an example of the increased uh, mitochondria that are present uh, in these muscle fibers. Uh, relative to the uh, white meat or the fast twitch fiber. Uh, and so I'm just going to uh, take you now on a little journey. I took you on a journey through uh, an uh, adipose cell. Let's take ourselves on a brief journey through a muscle cell. Uh, and if we can roll the video, I'm showing you here uh, a muscle cell um, containing these long myofibril stripes uh, that you can see going vertical, which are involved in the contraction a nucleus that is uh, close to the uh, cell surface, uh, and uh, what are called myocellular fat uh, depots. They're typically present uh, in people who are overweight and insulin resistant, but they can be drawn down with exercise to provide some energy to the fat pad. Now, fat from the diet uh, or from adipose tissue is going to uh, be taken up uh, from these fat pads or from other sources uh, during exercise. Um, and as you're going to see here, uh, a drug that was developed to PPAR delta can diffuse through the membrane of the uh, fat cell and bind to the PPAR delta receptor, very similar to what we saw with PPAR gamma. Uh, now we're looking at PPAR delta networks in muscle. Uh, it triggers the same type of effect, very similar receptor. Uh, the conformational change, the repressor is released. 
the genetic activation system uh, comes in, and now the muscle energy burning genes uh, are stimulated, and the muscle delta network is stimulated uh, to activate oxidative metabolism uh, in uh, this tissue, leads to a change in balance uh, of its energy composition as this network uh, flickers on and off and as these genes uh, are going. Uh, and thus, tinkering with the molecular machinery can cause the increased burning uh, of fat and adipose tissue and convert that stored energy uh, into uh, burned energy. Um, and therefore, by revving up the, T the PPR delta network, we might be able to increase energy burning. Now, that led to a potential experiment, um, is what would happen uh, if we do genetically rev up uh, PPR delta in muscle, and we increase this burning. And I'm going to show you, in fact, that we're able to do that. Uh, can genetically engineered fibers, as I'm going to show you, and if we actually, we actually show you from uh, the animals themselves, this, this is, these are cells from a PPA or delta uh, mouse that's been revved up, uh, and these are the cells from a wild type or a normal mouse. And so you can see there's more of these ATPase burning uh, non-fatiguing fibers. But normally, muscle fiber is generated by exercise. If you want to get slow twitch muscle, you got to go jogging or you have to go riding or swimming or something like that. Um, if you want to increase your fast twitch muscle, you got to sprint or do weightlifting or various other exercises. Or a combination of these two will it change the balance. We each are born with a ratio of these two fibers. You can shift that with exercise. If you do not exercise, you will be weaker. You'll have smaller muscle mass uh, relative to uh, if you do exercise. And that's both true for males and females. But all muscle generation is linked to motor neurons. And as you exercise more, and if you're a runner, you know this, that not only do your muscle fibers change, um, but also the circulation to the muscle fiber changes. Because as you get more fiber, you need more circulation. Also, you simply can't just get out and run. Um, your heart has to change along with your muscle. And so a long distance runner is going to have a much more powerful heart, which means a slower heartbeat uh, at rest. Um, and so all these changes, which are complex changes in body physiology, are part of training. And so now we genetically created a mouse that has never run. Um, it has artificial fibers in a sense. They're real fibers. They're in the muscle. But they've never been trained. And so will this mouse uh, be able to run better or worse uh, than the wild? Will the PPR delta mouse be able to run better or worse? And if we can run this uh, treadmill uh, video. Uh, the way we analyze this is we actually took mice and we put them on a mouse treadmill, just like we put on a human treadmill. Um, and the only difference with the mouse treadmill is that they can't get out. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the mouse treadmill in a moment. And then we're asking with the PPA or Delta mouse is it, it can talk the talk, but can it walk the walk? Um, and so I'm going to ask you to take your uh, little voting machines and tell me whether you think that the genetically engineered muscle is going to allow the uh, delta mouse uh, to be a better runner, a worse runner, or the same runner. And this is a long distance run. And it would be the very first run that the mouse has ever done, untrained. OK, man, we're going to see what you guys say. Uh, about half of you said that it's better, uh, and the other half said that it's going to be the same or worse. Um, and again, it's a little bit different than the other uh, surveys that we've taken in this. But before we go into, into actually showing you the actual experiment, I'm going to ask you, you saw the, the mice that were up here yesterday scampering around. And so since we're going to put these mice on a treadmill, I'm going to ask you, how long do you think a normal mouse can run on a treadmill in its first run. 15 minutes, 45 minutes, or 90 minutes. So let's see if you can uh, guess at this. And this will be, we'll look and see what the tabulated results are. Uh, and so 32%, uh, uh, this really scatters the group here a little bit. So 32% say 15 minutes. Um, 
46% say 45 minutes, uh, and a smaller number of you say 21, I mean 21 percent say 90 minutes, an hour and a half in its very first run. And so now we're going to look uh, and um, see, and I'll tell you the answer to this uh, as we look at the run. Um, if we can roll this video, here is the mouse uh, uh, on the treadmill. <laughs> and mice are very happy, they keep running along. Here they are uh, in the treadmill, just like a human treadmill, keep going. They keep running, wait, wait, this is the Smarty Jones experiment, who's going to win? It's like you've been at the carnival almost, okay. Let's get the bang. This is the delta mouse over here. This is the wild type mouse over here. Uh, and you can see basically both, they're both pretty good runners. Now let's move into the experiment uh, a little bit deeper from a different angle. Gonna, they will not run off the edge either, it's very interesting. Uh, so if we go uh, a little bit later into the experiment, here we're now at an hour and a half, 90 minutes into the experiment, this is the wild type mouse. This is the PPAR Delta revved up mouse. Aw, that's, but he did a good job. 90 minutes, he outperformed what most of you thought he would do. 80% of you did not have faith in him. Um, and so um, the revved up PPAR Delta mouse did something rather remarkable. He kept running on that treadmill for another hour. Um, vastly more than we had ever expected in his very first run. So this basically was a genetically engineered long distance runner. Um, it was an awesome change. Usually in science we expect changes of 5% or 10% if we're lucky. Uh, I love it when you get a surprise on the very first time uh, that's much more than you expect. Uh, and then you kind of realize that you're onto something. Um, and that's what happened in this experiment. It was recently published uh, only a few months ago. Um, and as a result, I find myself now suddenly working on uh, exercise physiology. Again, one of the last things I ever thought I would be working on, but one of the interesting things as it relates to the, the debate in society about the role of exercise, energy metabolism, uh, and health. And so I've become much more interested uh, in oxidative metabolism as a key feature in the uh, energy equation. Now. Uh, uh, Dr. Friedman showed you some of these animals yesterday. These are obese mice. Um, and I know they're very cute. Um, and they are very, very uh, nice mice. Um, <laughs> exceptionally friendly. Um, these are the cuddlers, I have to tell you. Um, and this is also an obese mouse. Eats the same amount of food. Basically gets the same amount of exercise uh, as its litter mate here. But this one has its PPAR delta metabolism revved up. Now, it's not a normal weight, but it does show you that revving up metabolism in the muscle uh, can cause increased uh, burning uh, of the adipose, the energy stored in adipose tissue, and lower the weight of this animal in about 30%, a very substantial weight. And so this is a, a genetically uh, thin mouse. Even without getting exercise, it's getting a benefit uh, from uh, the training. And so, uh, on the last slide here, I simply want to um, emphasize, kind of in summary, um, whether or not uh, if, uh, what the potential future might be for this type of metabolic pathway. Uh, and if there was a pill uh, that we could generate, and this is an example uh, uh, of that, what might, what might be possible to pharmacologically uh, uh, perform using the PPR delta pathway. And in fact, uh, there is a pill that has been developed. Um, I'm not going to make it available to all of you. It's still being still experimental at this stage right now. But um, uh, I will be uh, happy to talk about it in more detail. Uh, and these pills uh, actually have been developed for people. They've been given to monkeys. They've been given to animals. And they've been through uh, phase one clinical trials uh, in people. The goal is to try to lower lipids and improve lipid quality uh, of individuals who have hyperlipidemia. But uh, we believe that this pill may also have some potential benefits on, protect, on protecting individuals from weight gain. And we've been studying uh, that process uh, in these animals. And in fact, we can prevent weight gain in animals that are placed on a high fat diet. So I have one more uh, question for you. If you could create uh, this type of magic pill, and we go to the last question, a PPR delta pill that would rev up metabolism and promote weight loss, would you take the pill? And so um, 
let's just take, let's just see where you are in that. All anonymous. Well, there you go. 60% of you said, yay, I'm ready. OK, I'll talk to you guys afterwards. <laughs> the other 40%, the other thank you for coming. Um, uh, no, so, so this is very interesting, uh, and I think it just gives us something to think about, the potential of how science can impact on physiology and direct us into new areas of medicine and actually drug discovery, which obviously was not my initial goal in this work but maybe one of the important uh, consequences that come out of it. And on that level, I'm going to stop uh, and take questions. OK, one right here. I've read some articles that say that after exercise, um, people are more um, receptive to insulin. And I don't know if you, if, you found, if you found the same, if that research is still being held as correct. Yes. Well, it's a Yes, yeah, so the question is, after exercise, are people more sensitive to insulin? That's a very good question. Uh, and the basic answer to that is yes. In fact, uh, most physicians will tell anyone who is insulin resistant or diabetic that getting some exercise is very good, uh, in part because the exercise will burn down your blood glucose levels. Um, even a little bit of exercise will be very helpful there uh, and allow you to become uh, more insulin sensitive. Uh, and some steady exercise, even walking, is exceptionally beneficial uh, to people who are insulin resistant or diabetic. Uh, as you become obese or uh, very obese, it is harder to exercise. And therefore, it is harder to get uh, the benefit from exercise because you tend to tire out more quickly. But simply said, uh, any exercise that will burn down energy in the body is a very insulin sensitizing process. So exercise is good of any type. Does that, does that, do you know how that, do they know how that works in terms of hormones and such? Or? Uh, well, it has, two, it has two critical benefits. Uh, it reduces the store of energy that the body is containing. Remember, insulin resistance is in part a measure of the total amount uh, of energy that's being stored, particularly as fat. Uh, but sugar levels will, bur will burn down relatively quickly in your blood. And within about 30 minutes or so, even of walking at a moderate pace, you'll start burning down fat. And so you'll get the twin benefit, building up some muscle, burning down sugar, uh, as well as uh, burning up some fat. And so there's a, a, actually a triple benefit for uh, exercise. And you get a shirt for that. All right, one back there. Thank Are you. there side effects to that have been seen in this phase one of testing the PPR delta? and like giving it more than it's naturally made? So uh, the question was, are there side effects in giving the, uh, the PPR Delta drug that's under development? Uh, and so far, there really aren't any clear side effects uh, that we know from that particular drug. Uh, I should say that phase one trials are mostly safety trials. Um, and uh, they're designed to see if the drug is safe uh, in a population of relatively healthy people. Um, they uh, look to be fairly safe. They've been given to primates where they perform fairly well. But that's much different than putting a lot of people on a long-term trial, especially people who are uh, ill or have uh, medical problems such as Syndrome X. Uh, so whether uh, people who really need the drug will have problems, we don't know yet. But people who are reasonably in good shape, uh, and primates actually who are obese, uh, and insulin resistant seem to tolerate the drug fairly well. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be stumbling blocks. For most drugs, they do hit stumbling blocks. And anticipating that, already four or so more drug companies uh, are in the process of developing the next generation of PPAR Delta drugs. Again, using this exact molecular receptor, which I showed you uh, during the talk. And so, uh, so far, it's looking promising. I can make my, mice lose weight with this drug, but really don't know what's going to happen yet to people. Oh, close. Uh, let's go in the very back row. And I was wondering how long it takes for these injections to take effect um, on the muscle, for example, with the PPR delta. Uh, so the question was, uh, how long uh, does it take for a PPR delta drug to take effect? Actually, it, it begins to take an effect uh, very quickly within a few hours. But remember, we're looking at a transcriptional pattern here. Um, and so to manifest the complete effect, 
uh, we keep our animals on the drug for several days or a week. Uh, and we monitor changes in patterns of gene expression during that time. And one of the effects we see is the increase in uh, mitochondria, mitochondrial enzymes, and oxidative uh, enzymes involved in fat metabolism. Uh, but that actually begins relatively soon uh, and keeps going uh, for several weeks. And it can also be affected by whether you are exercising these animals or not. Uh, that's a good question. It's a progressive process. And I don't know if I can get this back there, but I'll try. Oh, she caught it, too. Time for one more question. We'll do it right here. Uh, I assume since there are these drugs are given in pill form, they eventually wear off. And I was wondering if there's any way to uh, genetically uh, affect these repressor proteins and allow the translation of the, uh, of the DNA uh, by way of uh, using a virus as a vector, perhaps, to achieve some sort of lasting genetic change? Uh, that, that is a way too sophisticated uh, question for a high school student, so I'm not going to give you that shirt at all. Uh, no, that's a very good question. Uh, and the answer is that already there are drugs that are being developed to act on the repressor proteins. Uh, those repressor proteins happen to be, to be enzymes. And so we can develop inhibitors to those enzymes that are called histone deacetylase inhibitors. Uh, a half a dozen of these are under development right now. If you inhibit that enzyme, it effectively acts like an activator of the whole pathway because you're inhibiting the repressor. Uh, and that's a very interesting new area uh, of pharmacology and gene control uh, that's currently under investigation. It's a very exciting area, uh, and it's one that we actively study uh, in our own lab. And it's going to be probably a source of a series of important new drugs. And so that is a question, and I'm just kidding. I will give you a t-shirt for that. There you go. Okay, uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, conclude. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, to talk to you. I have to say that I wish I could uh, answer all the questions. Uh, every time uh, there's time for one more question, I see about 80 hands go up, uh, and you guys have been real terrific about this, and so it's been a pleasure to uh, get a chance to tell you this story. Thank you all. Thank you, Ron, for that outstanding talk. We're going to take a break now for 30 minutes. When we come back, we'll have the final lecture of this series when Jeff Friedman will tell us about some evolutionary consequences or implications. <laughs>